important to me. I have been uh, asked to focus my remarks today on the uh, general topic of creating a family-friendly workplace, and I'm delighted to uh, comply with that, although I have to note that uh, becoming so closely associated with a topic such as this one uh, carries with it some risks. In 1996, when I was named CEO of the year by Working Mother magazine, my grown children, who are 31 and 29, uh, sort of cut to the chase pretty quickly by announcing to someone that dad has been named mother of the year. <laughs> but the rewards from all of that uh, also have been very tangible because wherever I go, uh, people seem to be intensely and increasingly interested in this general subject, more than I can recall with any other business-related topic. <coughs> And what that tells me is that in addressing these issues, we are addressing needs very deeply felt and heretofore very, very poorly met by most business institutions and most aspects of our society. Not surprisingly, the problems, I think, are much better known than the solutions. Much has been written about all of the changes sweeping over organizations today globalization, technological revolution, intensifying competition, successive waves of consolidation in industry after industry and company after company. And an equal amount of attention has been given to the impact of all of these forces upon workers at all levels and their families. What happens as organizational change is translated into various forms of individual stress. But not much of substance has been written about the ongoing efforts of organizations to manage the changes so as to mitigate the impact on employees. And that is unfortunate because mastering this challenge may well hold the key to long-term success for any organization going through wrenching change and what organization is not going through significant change. People in today's workforce, I think, are looking to employers to help, to help them cope with a set of needs of unprecedented urgency and complexity. On top of traditional needs for such benefits as health care and retirement savings, which today are far more complex than in the past, Employees now are grappling with an emerging set of new issues, issues such as child care, elder care, work schedules, and time management that employers in an earlier era uh, seldom had to deal with. For employers, the key question is what to do about the emerging cluster of needs. Toward what objective do we plan and by what metrics do we proceed and measure our progress? Good answers have been few and slow in coming, primarily because the same tension that we are so familiar with in the healthcare context, the tension between cost and quality, also characterizes discussion of this entire cluster of employee needs. Employees say we need balance, we need relief, we need help in dealing with responsibilities outside of our work. And employers respond, fine, but we can't possibly bear any new costs and survive in order to sustain employment. Now, if we are ever to break free of this loop, I think employers must find some proper point of balance, some mediating concept between these two apparent antithetical considerations. And to me, the mediating concept is the concept of value, not simply what you get, nor simply what you pay, but what you get for what you pay. What I believe we need is a search for a philosophy of value in human resource management. In my time with you this morning, I'd like to try to examine a framework for such a new perspective, drawing on 
the one case history that I know the best, and that is my own experience at Eli Lilly and Company over the past six years. You have to start, I think, with some idea of the value of people in your enterprise, and that may not be the same for all organizations. Lilly has placed a very high value on people from the very earliest days of the company. The company was founded in 1876. In 1933, Eli Lilly, the grandson of the founder, made the company's policy toward people very explicit. He said, and I quote, and this is also a commentary on the Times, uh, quote, the first responsibility of Lilly supervisors is to build men and then medicines. Now, that value has evolved in a variety of ways, and it has grown also as competition in the pharmaceutical industry has increased dramatically in recent years. The entire strategy of the company is built around innovation, which is to say brain power, which is to say talented people. And increasingly, Lilly is turning to teams as the most effective organizational structure for managing innovation. And again, this is a structure that depends on individual human relationships in order to get things done. In short, for us, the idea that people are our most important asset used to be a slogan that we hung on the wall. Today, the idea that people are our most important asset is not a canned value statement to be printed on a card and carried around. It is the fundamental premise of the Lilly business. It is the fundamental metric of the business. It is the single most important aspect of what we hold the leaders of the business accountable for. Lilly holds all supervisors formally accountable for how they coach and develop and communicate with the people that they lead. And their performance, in turn, provides the basis for a people component in the scorecard which measures how senior managers are running the enterprise as a whole. Now, before I go any further, let me throw in a disclaimer here. I certainly don't pretend for a moment that Lilly has somehow worked out all of the answers to all of the very complex personnel issues that all companies are wrestling with today. And even in those areas where Lilly has, I, I, I don't want to represent that the Lilly solutions are necessarily the solutions that fit the needs of, of other enterprises. But I do think we have made a lot of progress. And I think Lilly is very much on the right track and there may be some ideas in our approach that others can find and will find useful. At Lilly, the, the keystone of our philosophy of employment is a concept that three or four years ago I began to refer to as the concept of reciprocity. We believe that there is a reciprocal bond that ties together employer and employee. And our work ethic tries to recognize and to harmonize the mutual needs, the reciprocal needs, of the company and its people. When a new need of the workforce is identified, uh, management, of course, asks, you know, what is this going to cost the company? But we also ask and try objectively to answer, uh, what will this gain for the company? And accordingly, the human resources policies and practices that we have developed are aimed at attracting and retaining, and above all, enabling the talented people on whom our success depends in total. Lilly's philosophy is reasonably consistent across most of the key policy and program decisions that affect employees. The approach to compensation, for example, tries to reinforce the commonality of interests of all Lilly employees by pushing the idea of ownership, of game sharing, much more broadly than most companies typically do. In other words, in addition to competitive wages, 
Virtually all Lilly employees worldwide are eligible to receive some form of their compensation that is contingent upon the company's financial performance. Almost all employees, except in a handful of corners of the world where the laws do not permit us to do so, um, almost all Lilly employees have some level of stock ownership, including occasional grants of stock options to all employees. When I became the chairman and CEO in 1993, it was very clear that our employees resented the fact that those people up there are constantly worrying about the price of the stock. And if they just give me the new equipment I need or the additional people I need or whatever, everything would be all right. We gave every employee in the company 100 stock options in the summer of 1993, which meant that based on the price of the stock at that time, which was about $50, um, employees beginning three years later could buy stock for $50 without regard to what the market price was, which means that if the stock was about $200, which I think it was, um, they could uh, cash in their 100 stock options and keep the $150 gain uh, on each stock option. Well, guess what? Behavior changed dramatically. I could not go into a building any place in the world but what I would find a chart that the employees had posted looking at the stock market uh, close every day. Uh, a very important part of, of our effort to get uh, buy-in. Um, for any executives who think that giving employee stock options uh, and, and uh, putting part of their pay at risk uh, isn't, an, isn't a reasonable approach to payroll, I would simply ask them to explain then why is that a reasonable, reasonable approach for executive compensation. Uh, and we are finding it to be a very motivational thing for all of our employees. That's really all that we have done with all that we are doing, and that is to recognize that everyone's motivation can be fortified by being given a stake, an ownership position in the results. As an aside, uh, this may sound like a concept that maybe couldn't be applied every place in the world, but in fact, uh, uh, I am involved in a, uh, in a program as the part of the medical center at uh, Duke where we are looking for a way to create phantom stock uh, as if it were a company in order to motivate the people who work in the medical center on a very different uh, basis than has historically been done. Lilly's philosophy of reciprocity uh, also colors strongly the company's approach to training and career development. We have made very clear, not just in words, but far more significantly in our actions, that even when times are tough, we will stretch to do everything we possibly can to keep good people with the company. And on the other side of the coin, employees understand that they too have to stretch and be, be flexible. And to, to take responsibility for keeping their knowledge and their skills relevant in a constantly and rapidly changing work environment. And that is why Lilly has been putting more emphasis on the need for employees to have access to career-long training, education, and development opportunities. And that is why we are asking people to take responsibility themselves for pursuing those opportunities. In the mid-1960s, when I left college and joined the workforce, it was certainly my expectation that my career would be focused on the skills and capabilities that I would learn in the early part of my career. And I think that was the expectation of most people in my generation. Today, the people that we hire off the college campuses coming to Lilly uh, uh, have a very different kind of expectation. And the one thing we know for sure is that almost without exception, the job that people come into the company into will not exist uh, at the time that person's career is over. In other words, the life cycle of the job is going to be shorter 
than the working lifetime of the individual. And so education and training and skills development is a journey. It's not a project. And it's something that people have to be prepared to do all of their lives. And conversely, corporations have to step up to helping employees understand what skills are going to be needed, what skills are not going to be uh, needed, and to provide tools uh, to help people uh, continue to develop their skills. The same philosophy drives our approach to healthcare benefits. Lilly takes what others might consider to be a somewhat gold-plated approach because we have a very strong emphasis on high-quality, comprehensive medical care. I don't think it is a gold-plated approach at all. You might assume that our approach to health care reflects our bias as a health care company, but that also is not really the case. The driver, once again, is our belief and our recognition that our success depends on our people. We have a huge investment in them and an absolute dependency on our people, and therefore our willingness to invest seriously in their good health is simply a way of protecting all of what we have at stake. But this is certainly not to say that we are indifferent to cost. Far from it. It is just that we ask two questions. Not only what are we spending, but also what are we getting in return for what we are spending. It is the value proposition. In all of our programs, we place a very heavy emphasis on prevention and early detection of health problems. We give our people incentives and we get 90% participation in a program that provides professional consultations, regular exams, screening services tailored to the employee's age and gender and hobbies and work assignments. The program includes some costly but invaluable services like preventive colonoscopy, on-site mammography for our employees, retirees, and their spouses over 40. We also offer on-site medical services, walk-in clinics where staff of company physicians, psychologists, pharmacists, and physical therapists and nurses handle more than 50,000 visits a year. Now, this may sound like another luxury, but on the contrary, I see this as a value investment. We can demonstrate that our on-site services saved the company more than $3 million last year from what we believe we would have spent if we did not offer those services. There is a similar case in point in our approach to pharmaceutical benefits. Now, this is an area where I'm probably not totally objective uh, and where we very emphatically do practice what we preach. But we do so with a very interesting result. Our general message to all of our large customers is that in many therapeutic situations, new innovative technology in new innovative pharmaceutical products can give greater value, better clinical results, and better economic results than older, cheaper therapeutic choices. And we act on that advice in our own plan. We have always offered very liberal pharmaceutical benefit coverage. And looking at the most recent data, our use of prescription drugs runs somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% above the expected norm for a, an employee population such as ours in the corporate world in general. What is interesting about this is that in just about every other area of our health care, inpatient visits, outpatient visits, surgery, and so on, our usage runs as much as 40% below the predicted norm in corporate populations. And we believe we are spending our money in a much more cost-effective way, both clinically and economically. We believe our results offer a potentially marvelous case study for our own marketing efforts. Um, and we are looking for ways to gather and generate uh, more, more and better metrics uh, on that point. But again, the point I want you to see is that Lilly has a very long tradition of valuing the people in, it's in the company. And therefore, 
when more and more employees began to feel pushed and pulled between work life and home life, the company had a mindset already disposed toward trying to find solutions. In fact, ironically, um, we've kind of uh, been living on our reputation as a good place to work and a company that cared a lot about its people for a long, long time. I want to tell you an interesting story to, to illustrate uh, what I mean by that. Back in the 1930s, the standard work hours in um, Indianapolis for most companies uh, was 8 to 5 with an hour at lunch. And the Lilly family um, reached the conclusion that it would really be nice if employees could have more time at home with their families. And a way to do that was thought to be to changing the work hours from 8 to 5 with an hour at lunch to 7.30 to 4.15 with 45 minutes at lunch. And again, unique for the times, this proposal was put to the employees for a vote. And in the mid-1930s, the, the employees voted to adopt those hours. When I came to Lilly in 1993 and began to look at some of the issues that we were facing, um, I commissioned a survey to find out who are the people who work for us. If you looked around the executive suite, and particularly if you've done so uh, 5, 10, 15 years later, the executive suite was populated by essentially white males from the Midwest. Most of them were married uh, to women who, who had chosen to uh, manage the house and raise the children. And that was the mindset they had, <coughs> largely, of who Lily people were. Well, guess what? That's 18% of our U.S. workforce of about 14,000 people. 82% of Lily employees are in some model other than the one where uh, mother and dad are married, there are a couple of children, mother stays home, manages the house, and raises the children, and dad gets up and goes to work. 82% of our employees are something else, and yet all of our family-friendly policies up to that point in time were based on a premise that that's what the employee population looked like. And as a result, um, you've got this wonderful program of hours from 7.30 to, or, uh, 7.30 to 4.15, uh, except mom and dad are both leaving in the morning, and they're leaving at uh, quarter till 7 in order to be there at 7.30, leaving the 6-year-old and the 8-year-old at home in the dark waiting for the school bus to come. Not exactly a family-friendly uh, environment. Um, this uh, prompted us to, um, uh, to take a, a much harder look at uh, what is it that we really needed to do in order to meet the needs of our employees with such a large number of single parents, dual wage earners, uh, single people, childless couples, grandparents responsible for grandchildren, and uh, the like. For many of our employees, accomplishing the daily chores needed to keep a household running can be a logistical nightmare. Uh, dealing with a snow day in the school system can be a crisis. Um, coping with the sudden illness of an elderly parent can be a catastrophe. And for all of them, including the minority living in the traditional family structure, the effort to make not just a good living but a good life can be continual sources of stress and strain. And when we hire an employee, we don't just hire the part of the employee that works for us eight or nine or ten hours a day. We're hiring the whole employee. And so all those stresses and strains come with that part of the employee that's performing the job. And we're burying our head in the sand if we don't recognize it. And so over the past several years, we have initiated a very wide array of work family programs to try to help our people cope with these new needs. Among other things, we have created 
personal leaves of up to three years for dependent care, flexible work arrangements including flex time, part-time, job sharing, and work at home arrangements. For the last two years, my principal speechwriter is a woman whose husband is an FBI agent who was transferred from uh, where they lived in California before she came to work for the company uh, to a job in the FBI headquarters in, in Virginia. She has telecommuted and done a wonderful job. Indeed, I suspect she does more creative writing because she's at home where the phone's not ringing and people are not uh, uh, bothering her, and yet she is physically present enough that she's developed all of the networking and, and so forth to, uh, to help get that done. Uh, we've put in, as a, a fairly standard arrangement, nursing mother stations for new moms. Uh, we have a child development center at our corporate headquarters. This center provides uh, daycare for about 250 children of our employees and does so at competitive rates in the community for high class child care. In other words, I don't want to be in the child care business. I'm not in the business of giving away a perk of child care. It's just that high quality, convenient child care uh, near our corporate center was not available. We have made it available and we're getting our money back through the tuition we charge uh, to uh, the uh, parents, the employee parents who uh, are frankly lucky enough at the moment to be using it because the demand has been so great we have a, a lottery and we're building uh, right now a second child care center. We have a school vacation program that includes eight weeks of science summer camp. Uh, we provide a, a program where the children of any employee can enroll in our science summer camp where there's a different curriculum in each of the eight uh, summer weeks. Um, we have um, uh, one-day programs for school holidays, which can become uh, a nightmare problem that works somewhat on the same principle. We took space in our facilities that that was essentially being unused for any productive purpose and have leased it to vendors so that we now have in our corporate headquarters uh, on-site shops and facilities to help employees with a whole variety of daily needs. We have a, a full service credit union, uh, we have a dry, dry cleaning outlet, we have a shoe repair, we have a convenience store, and we have company cafeterias that prepare ready to uh, serve, take home hot meals four nights a week. Now, you know, think about people in our workforce who are uh, married wage earners, uh, singles who are leaving the building thinking, oh my God, I gotta get, I gotta worry about where I'm gonna eat. Uh, the ability to call the cafeteria and make arrangements to carry out a hot meal um, sounds like a terrific thing. The fact of the matter is, it is not used nearly as much as I thought it would be used, and yet it is highly popular, which tells us that employees take some measure of comfort about the fact that they know it's there if they want to use it, and, and many of them use it only occasionally. Um, probably an interesting insight into uh, the way people really think about these things, I suppose. Um, the logic behind these and many other initiatives that we have taken is very, very clearly not altruism. This is a very pragmatic business decision. I might think this is the right thing to do, but I don't own the company. We have to do things that make business sense. And we are addressing work family concerns because to the people on whom the company depends, these issues are as important as ensuring that our facilities have lights so that people can see, that their PCs are positioned so that they are less likely to get carpal tunnel syndrome, and that they get their paychecks accurately and on time. The company's objective is to build and maintain an environment where people can do what they want to do. People can do their best. And to me, that is simply a core responsibility of the leadership of the business at all levels. And again, the concept of reciprocity applies here. Because just as Lilly extends new tools to meet the new needs of our workforce, so too do we expect our people to go the extra mile for the company when that is necessary. The 
bottom line is that Lilly's efforts to support employees' work-life priorities equates, in my view, to good business. These are not perks. These are not giveaways. These tools, we believe, help Lilly attract, motivate, and retain the top quality people who are far more likely to be dedicated and more focused and more productive. We know intuitively and from employee opinion surveys that all of our philosophy of reciprocity in human resources does indeed create the value that we see. It would be nice if we had more uh, metrics by which we could prove this, and that's something I think is going to be increasingly important going forward. To the best of my knowledge, neither Lilly nor any other like-minded employer has yet established what anybody sees as enough hard data to provide the linkage between, say, health care benefits and work family programs and such desired results in improvements and lower absenteeism and so on. And we need more comprehensive ways of studying the broad network of causal interconnection among all of these things. I am aware of a relatively new piece of work that was done collaboratively between the Fleet Financial Corporation, a large uh, bank and, and financial services company in the Northeast, and the uh, Radcliffe Public Policy Institute at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, I know about this because my wife is a trustee at Radcliffe, and uh, one of my good friends is the chairman and CEO of Fleet, who thinks all this stuff is soft, fluffy waste of money. His wife is also a trustee at Radcliffe, and so whether he liked it or not, Fleet Financial funded a program at the Radcliffe Public Policy Institute to study two groups of employees at Fleet, though a group of employees who were involved in uh, an area of the business that had a number of these kinds of family-friendly programs and a number of employees who did not. And um, after, uh, I think, about 12 months of this program, uh, the data certainly strongly suggests that turnover rates, absenteeism rates, employee morale, uh, all of those kinds of measurements from employee attitude surveys were much more positive. Uh, among the employees who are working in a far more friend, uh, family-friendly environment. I think not exactly what uh, my friend had uh, thought he would, uh, would prove from all of this, but we need much more of that kind of, of uh, hard data. In the meantime, uh, to help advance the cause of all of this in other organizations, um, I think it's important to focus attention among other things, on, on the very tight labor market that we are experiencing today. Certainly in the case of Lilly and its peers, all of us are competing fiercely for talented people, not only within industries, but across industries. And therefore, investing in people has become a vital strategic issue and I think a source of competitive advantage. More broadly, I think you can make a very persuasive case that one of the important dynamics of the new global economy is a new way of understanding the value of people. The, econ the economies of the developed nations of the world depend on a new kind of worker, the knowledge worker. The knowledge worker's value lies not merely in what they can do with their hands, but what they can do with their minds. And that is, more often than not, a value that appreciates over time. And I assure you that anyone running an organization today understands the attraction of investing in that which will appreciate over time. Even though we at Lilly do not yet have data to show precisely what each human resource program yields, we do have evidence that our philosophy of putting people first has produced excellent results. As you heard earlier, our investment in people, as it has intensified, our market value and our effectiveness in the market has grown tremendously from roughly $14 billion in mid-1993 uh, through $75 billion. And in fact, this week, the company has a value of slightly over $100 billion. Eli Lilly and Company, probably to your amazement, 
is actually now the 23rd largest corporation in the world. In two comprehensive employee surveys in the last five years, we can trace a very strong rise in employee satisfaction, employee commitment, and employee alignment with the strategies of the company. And above all, we have seen that proof demonstrated in the financial performance of the company and the value that has been created for the owners of the company. When Lilly asks people to stretch, they go above and beyond, and they have certainly delivered the extraordinary performance. For example, the last two major products that Lilly has launched, Zyprexa for schizophrenia and Evista for the treatment of osteoporosis, were developed and brought to market by special cross-functional teams which in each case drove themselves to beat the original timetable by, in each case, 18 months, which is unheard of in our industry. You cannot command the kind of commitment that made that possible. You cannot even buy the kind of commitment that made that possible. But I think you can earn it. And that is part of the return that I believe has been there for us in investing in our people. I don't want to leave you with the impression that Lilly's philosophy represents uh, some kind of nirvana for employees or is a perfect or complete solution in the very complex set of issues of work-life balance, because neither impression would be right. And so before we move to some discussion, let me just add a couple of cautionary comments. First, I would offer the caution that not all the needs that employees might feel about the tensions between their work and the rest of their lives away from work can or should be addressed by their employers. There is a subtle but crucial distinction, I think, to be drawn here between different kinds of needs and expectations for remedies. To the extent that what an employee is saying is, help me keep the other parts of my life from interfering in my work, I think employers' best interests are served by trying to provide that kind of help. But to the extent that what an employee is really saying is, help me keep my work from interfering with the rest of my life, uh, this points to a set of needs that employers are far less likely to be willing to address. To be expected to travel, to be asked to relocate, to be so busy that you have to bring work home at night, these surely can be stressful and hard on employees and hard on families, but they are all things that the organization needs to have done. The best solution for an employee who cannot bear to do them is probably to get out of a job that's going to entail those kinds of burdens and to find one that does not, and to accept the trade-offs that come with that choice. In my experience, this is not an issue that comes up most often for women in many organizations for the simple if lamentable reason that women still bear a disproportionate burden in our society of making the sorts of choices that entail trade-offs. My 31-year-old attorney daughter, who is a six-month mother, is going through that series of trade-offs right now. Does she want to be a mother? Does she want to be a lawyer? Does she want to be a mother lawyer, a lawyer mother? How does all that fit in? It is a struggle. And it is the sociology of families far more than the sociology of work that makes all of this, I think, very difficult. Whatever the case, I have heard the same frustration expressed by women in many venues. I want a career, but I also want a family. I want to be able to spend time with my children, but I'm afraid if I take that time, my career will suffer. I think the best response that I can make to those employees is to simply share the advice of my colleague, Becky Goss, who is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel and the highest ranking woman in the history of the Lilly Company. Um, because she recently said to a group of women in my presence, you can have it all. You just cannot have it all at the same time. There are trade-offs, and I think that is a very important concept 
to understand. A second caveat that I would offer is that while it is entirely appropriate to begin to solve work-life work conflicts by asking employers to do what they can, employers cannot be the sole source of solutions to these very complex issues. The huge changes we have seen in the demographics of work represent a major evolution of our social order. All of our social institutions need to be re-examined and, where possible, overhauled to adapt to this new reality. Why is it that with such a disproportionate part of our society today um, tied up in um, married couples who both work outside the home or singles who work outside the home, why is it that so many of the businesses and institutions that deliver services to a household still say, will somebody be there from eight to five? I mean, these are institutions that are out of touch with the realities of the need for new paradigms in the way in which work is organized. I'm maybe opening a door here that we don't have time to enter, uh, but let me just want, offer one example. Many of the stress points in the work-life balance have to do with finding ways to meet the needs of children in single parent or double earner families. What are our schools doing to address a new paradigm? What sense does it make that they cleave to a daily schedule, or for that matter, to a yearly calendar shaped by the needs of an agrarian society of the 19th century? What sense does that make? Clearly, when you begin to follow this line of inquiry, you can see that it will take you on a long and very complex tour of a great many other institutional assumptions that are no longer aligned to meet the needs of people today. And as a society, we have got to start thinking out of the box about how we're going to address these issues. The point is that while there is still a great deal more to be done, in the workplace to help everyone have both a living and a life, the workplace need not be the only arena of questions and answers. It may be time to widen the discussion and the search for solutions beyond the close circle of employers and employees. It may be time to include many more participants in a discussion to discover and to deliver a philosophy of value. What do you get for what you pay as we think about how we manage and organize the daily lives of the citizens of this country? Thank you very much.